Welcome to 168 Community Church. I'm Carl, one of the pastors here at 168. Our name 168 comes from 1 Chronicles 16.8. In this verse, we see a new story beginning for God's people, one where they're pursuing God, participating in their community, and proclaiming God to all people. This is who we want to be as a community. We want to help people pursue Jesus, participate in the flourishing of our communities, and proclaim Jesus among all people. Here at 168, we believe in community. We believe in walking through seasons of life together. So before you leave today's service, whether in person or online, please feel free to ask for prayer, counsel, or help. Our community is here to support one another in good times and bad. I'm Carl Fisher, and remember, you have 168 hours this week. Go and leverage every single one for Jesus. Church, we're so glad that you're here with us this afternoon. I don't know what kind of week that you've had, uh, but let's um, take this moment here as a chance to sing and reset. So let's stand together and give God a song of praise. So wherever you're at, let's sing out the song with faith, knowing that the Lord is faithful. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise, let prayers arise. We'll sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We we'll sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let prayers Break down every wall To watch the giants fall For fear cannot survive When we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift you high Through all creation cry God we praise you Oh, we praise you Faith be a song that overcomes the rage and sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. Oh, we'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift you high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift you high. For fear cannot survive. We praise you. We'll see you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The 
God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift Him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise You. Oh, oh, oh we praise You.
become more aware as you fill us up, God. Thank you for your spirit that you've given us, that you sent to fill us up. I pray that you would lead us with your spirit, God, that you would show us what you need us to see today, and that we would see would be revealed through your word today. We love you so much. Hey, welcome to 168 Community Church. My name is Carl Fisher. I am one of the pastors here at 168. I would love to meet you if I have not met you yet. Hey, for today's announcements, whether you're here in person or online, if you go ahead and text the word today to the number 855 855- 822-0168. You'll get all of today's announcements. That way you can carry it with you all week long. If you're like, man, what did he say? When is that happening? It is all there. Again, that's 855-822-0168. Hey, parents of students, this Tuesday is for you. We are going to have our student community parent meeting this Tuesday, September 21st at 7 p.m. at Triumph Community Church in Bolingbrook. It is right off of Remington. We love this location because it is right in the middle of all of our communities. We feel it's an easy commute for midweek ministry for our student community. We will have a parent meeting where you will meet the leaders. You will hear how student community will be ran. You will get a calendar of everything that is happening between now and Christmas. Uh, And then you get to meet other students in our student community. We are so excited. The leaders have been meeting and planning, and we are just ready to roll. We've had plans ready since April, and we are ready to roll this fall. So you don't want to miss that. 7 p.m. on Tuesday at Triumph Community Church. Hey, we are still looking for people to help us partner with World Relief. We have seven people confirmed uh, right now to find out more information about how to help refugees. Our goal is to have 10 So are you one of the last three people to say yes to helping out refugees with world relief? I mean, do you want a tangible way to help refugees? Uh, Or just as God reminds us in Deuteronomy 10.18 that God loves the foreigner residing among us, giving them food and clothing. Listen, all you need to do to be one of those three is head over to 168cc.org slash community. Send us a message. Uh, Our first meeting will actually be via Zoom. That way we can cut down your travel. You can be in your own home. Uh, you can be in your garage like I've been lately with my Zoom calls, but it blurred out in the back so you can't see my mess. But still, it'll be on Zoom to cut down your travel there. Hey, just a reminder, some things that are coming up in October as a community and a way to engage is we'll actually have a child dedication on October 24th. Uh, but before that, we'll actually have a child dedication class on October 10th. If you are interested in getting your child or children dedicated, please send us an uh, email at info at 168cc.org, or you can find myself or Pastor John, and we would love to get you set up uh, to attend that class as well as get your child dedicated. And another thing coming up in October is we will actually be having our first worship night as a community. It'll be here at Horizon Community Church. We are waiting to lock in the date this week, but we will let you know it will fall in the week of a small group meeting. And our hope is that this worship and prayer night will replace your small group for that week. We will gather together and just worship the Lord. And we are so excited to be able to do that. Uh, The last thing is if our values and our mission here or what's going on at 168 or the way that we carry ourselves or it resonates with you, there are three ways that you can support our mission here at 168, and they're they're on the screen behind me. The first one is you can give on our website, 168cc.org, or you can give in person 
in the box to the back on your way out the door or simply mail a check or money to the address on the screen. Hey, one of our values here at 168 is we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in prayer over self-reliance. And so as we head uh, into the message, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads really quickly. We're just going to pray for the message. We're going to pray for what's going on uh, in our world and in even, even, even in our own communities. So bow your heads for me. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you, Lord. We are so God, I don't know what's going on in the room today. I don't know what's going on behind the screen. I don't know what people are bringing to you right now, Lord, but we want to lay every one of those things at the foot of your cross. We want to lay every one of those things at your feet, God, knowing that you are in control, knowing that you have already won the war and the battle. God, we just need to submit to you, Lord. I pray right now in this moment that we submit all those things that are going on in our lives, our anxieties, our fears, the barriers that we have up right now, Lord, so that we can come to you and just hear what you have to say to us this week about the Holy Spirit, God. Bring, bring our hearts, our ears, our minds, our bodies to what you have to say to us this week through Pastor John about the Holy Spirit. It's in your, your son's precious name that we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, thank you, Pastor Carl, for those announcements. Hey, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, starting in 1. And we're going to go all the way to verse 16. So hopefully you had some fun last week with snow cones and popcorn. Yeah. Those, uh, wow, oh, all right. Those snow cone pumps, though, were pretty aggressive, huh? They're pretty aggressive. Hey, we're in week two of our Holy Spirit series. And last week, this was kind of the summary of what we talked about. We'll put it on the screen behind me. Is that the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of you, if you're a believer in Jesus, is better than the presence of Jesus beside you. Now, today I want to start off with a quote that gives some direction to where we're headed in regard to the Holy Spirit. And there's a guy named C.H. Spurgeon, and this is what he says. He says, without the Spirit of God, without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. We are as ships without wind. I just want you to pause and think about that just for a minute. So if you're a sailor or you have a sailboat or if you've ever seen one on a video, right, if there is no wind blowing, you're not going to go anywhere. You might have two arms and paddles, and you might be able to paddle very rigorously across a small pond, but in order for you to be on a boat and to have some gusto to move across the Atlantic, you need some wind, don't you? And today in John chapter 3, we're going to hear Jesus using this imagery of the wind to not describe a ship sailing across the ocean, but to describe a heart that needs to be reborn by the wind, the Holy Spirit, so that we might receive salvation. Now, if you're new to this whole Christian thing, and, and John 3, 16, though, sounds kind of familiar. You're like, you know what? That verse, it resonates with me for a reason. This might be the reason. You can just show it real quick. That's Tim Tebow. And that night, when he played this game, and he put John 3, 16 on his, black, his blackouts on his eyes, 92 million people Googled the word or phrase because they didn't know what it was, John 3.16. 92 million people looked it up, trying to figure it out. What does it even mean? So as we kind of work towards our John 3.16 verse that you may know, go ahead and turn to John chapter 3, starting in verse 1 to 2, and we're going to see even what is the role of the Holy Spirit even in salvation. How does Jesus unpack that and write it in? So John chapter 3, starting in verse 1 to 2, we're going to notice just three points of emphasis, but it says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a, who was a member of the, of the Jewish ruling council. Now he came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. For nobody could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now three points of emphasis. Notice first in verse 1 that Nicodemus is part of the Jewish ruling council. Now the Jewish ruling council in Israel's day was the version, it's our version of the Supreme Court. Now in the nation of Israel there wasn't a separation of church and state. That means not only did you have politicians be a part of this Jewish ruling council, but you also had priests and you also had Pharisees, which is why Nicodemus was a part of this Jewish ruling council, the Supreme Court of their day. Now, Pharisees like Nicodemus in John chapter 3, they were extremely scrupulous about observing every single minute detail of the law of God as they understood it and as they interpreted it. And the reason why I say interpreted is because Pharisees were actually, hear this part, they were innovators, they were not traditionalists. 
So when, I, when you think about the law, right, even in modern 2021, if you're a traditionalist, you're the person who's driving off of 355 and you see the speed limit sign that says 55 miles per hour. And if you're a traditionalist, you say it says 55, not 54, not 56. I'm driving 55. And, and if you drive a little bit faster than that, then you're probably guilty like me maybe some mornings when I need more of the Holy Spirit inside of my life. You drive by and you give them a stink eye, but they don't care because they always get a stink eye because they're always driving 55, right? But a traditionalist, like, um, not like actually Nicodemus, was a stickler of the law. They saw the 613 laws of the Old Testament, and they said there's 613 laws, period. You should keep the 613 laws. Now, the innovators, which Nicodemus is one, you might be thinking, so if Nicodemus is trying to innovate the law, does that mean Nicodemus is the guy, and maybe you think this way? Sure, it says 55, but there's like a 10, driving over 10 rule, right? Where supposedly the cops won't pull you over if you're driving 10 over. So you say, you know what? I'm gonna innovate the law, I'm gonna drive 65. But you know, I'm kind of running late to church right now, so let's just add another 10, so you're going 75. And then you say, you know what, I like whole numbers. Let's just make it a whole even 80, right? And now you're just driving 80 miles per hour and you're driving past this traditionalist, giving them a stink eye saying, what's going on with this guy? He's driving so slow. And if you're thinking that Nicodemus is an innovator, meaning he innovates the law so that it could pertain better to him, you'd be completely wrong. Innovators actually like Nicodemus, this Pharisee, they would actually look at a law like Exodus chapter 34, verse 21, which says, you shouldn't, you shouldn't plow. You shouldn't work on the harvest. And you know what they worked on? They said, but wait, if it says don't work on the harvest and I, and I seem to have some seeds in my pocket and I'm walking around and I shuffle my feet and some seeds fall out, did I just plow? Those were the questions that Pharisees like Nicodemus were asking. They were trying to figure out how to innovate, meaning what are the innovations of the law if it says don't work or harvest on a Sabbath that we could potentially break? It was this idea that they never wanted to supersede the law by ensuring that there was more laws. That was the innovation. It wasn't an innovation to break the law, but to figure out how can we safeguard so that we are morally within the framework of not breaking it. Now, if you're the first child, you're like, I love Team Nicodemus, right? You're like, yes. How can we ensure that I am within the moral grounds of making sure I'm keeping the rules? And all you middle children, you're not even listening because you don't care, right? Now, all of these laws, if you kind of watch the story of Jesus, you see him confronting some Pharisees later on. Because those Pharisees were specifically creating more laws, they were innovating on the law so that there might be a harder burden on the people. I mean, can you imagine just walking around thinking, oh no, I had seeds in my pocket and I shuffled and some of them fell down, what does God think of me today? I mean, that's a very burdensome way to live. But if you have your Bibles, and if you want to make a notation, in John 7, 50, it seems like Nicodemus is not trying to bring a bigger burden on people, but he just genuinely wants to be in God's good graces. He believes that living a morally good life is the way towards salvation. Now, some of you here, this kind of describes how you try to live your life, right? You're the goody two-shoe. You're the one who always is a stickler about recycling. I don't know why recycling came to mind, right? But you're just, that's the right way. That's the way to do it. You always read all the rules at the local pool before entering, right? That's you. You just want to know the nuances of what's right and what's wrong. You're the one who's driving 55 on 355, right? That's you. Now, you might not even be a Christian, but in 2021, here's the question to see if this is you. Are you always anxious about whether you're good enough? or if you're doing good enough, if you're following the moral right so that you might be in Jesus's good graces. Is that you? Well, if that's you, John 3 and actually the Holy Spirit has some words for you today. But second, notice that in verse two, it says that Nicodemus came to Jesus at nighttime. Do you see that detail? It doesn't say daytime, it actually says nighttime. And the question is, why does John, who's writing this, include that detail? Is it because it's an, just an irrelevant historical detail he just wanted to add? He had nothing better to say, so he just says night. You know, is it because Nicodemus was embarrassed because he's a, a Jewish ruling council and he doesn't want to be seen by others, so he's walking at nighttime in the cloak of darkness? 
But if you actually study through the book of John, we begin to see that he develops themes and he uses words to make a point. So in John chapter 3, verse 19, it's going to be behind me, he's using the imagery of darkness to show a reflection of where Nicodemus is at, his heart's space. And in John 3, 19, it says, this is the verdict, light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light. So John is saying about Nicodemus that he's so wrapped up in wanting to please God through his innovative morality that he's spiritually blinded to the truth. He's still living in darkness. He hasn't seen the light of Jesus. But finally, notice in verse 2, the word we, right? That's in a plural form, right? But if you look at the beginning of verse 2, we notice that there are only two people in this conversation. It's he who is Nicodemus and Jesus. So why does Nicodemus use the plural form we? You know, if you have an older sibling, uh, you might have uh, potentially have tried to use the corporate we, which is much easier than standing up on a singular I. Right, so imagine you're like six years old and your 10-year-old brother, you see him sneaking into the kitchen. And mom explicitly said, nobody gets to eat a double stuffed Oreo. Okay, that is not allowed before dinner. But he takes one. If you're courageous and you're willing to stand up to your older brother with a singular I, you might say to him, I saw what you did. You took that cookie. But if in that moment you want to dissipate some responsibility, you want to alleviate some of that pressure, maybe you've done this. I've done it before with my older brother. You say, we saw you. But who's we? In that moment, your older brother is either going to call your bluff and say, hey, who's we? It's just me and you, you doofus. Or he's going to feel paranoid and say, please, don't tell anybody, okay? Like, don't tell mom, whoever you are. You know what's happening in verse 2 with Nicodemus and Jesus? John is pointing out the fact that the reason why he uses the plural we is because he's not yet ready to take responsibility, singular responsibility over his own salvation. It's much easier to hide behind the corporate we. Hey, we know. We've seen this. And one of the applications of this text in John 3 is, have you, singular, taken the responsibility to come before Jesus and to ask him the question about salvation? Take a look at verse 3. Uh, Jesus actually calls Nicodemus' bluff. He says, very truly, which means this is for real. And he uses the singular. He says, I tell you. I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, hey, are we having a conversation or not? Who is this we that you keep mentioning? It's just you and me, right? I tell you, nobody can enter the kingdom of God. In verse 4, but how can someone be born when they are old? Right, hey, Nicodemus is either being super sarcastic or he's a little simple in the mind. He's just thinking about the physical. He says, but how can someone be born when they're old? Surely, this is kind of graphic, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. That's a little creepy to think about, crawling back up into your mother's womb. So here's the question. At this point, is Nicodemus just being sarcastic? And he deserves to be smacked up upside the head for being sarcastic to Jesus? That is plausible, but if you look at verse 2, you're going to notice that Jesus identif or Nicodemus identifies Jesus as a teacher who is from God. That's a term of, term of respect. He says rabbi or teacher. So it's most likely not being sarcastic. Or you might say, well, maybe Nicodemus is just really unintelligent. He, he's just so off course that when he's thinking about salvation, he says, but how can you crawl back up into your mother's room? That doesn't make any sense. Well, last week, um, I shared with you that I don't have a green thumb, right? I can't plant anything. That's really not my gifting. Uh, and, but I did plant a few things. And so last week, uh, this couple came up to me, and they're like, hey, tell me, tell me about what you planted. What are these plants and flowers that you planted? Uh, because they do have a green thumb. They actually even have an app where you can take a picture of the plant, and it tells you what it is. That's what I needed two weeks ago, right? 
And uh, I'm trying to think, like, hey, what are, what are the names? And I'm like, hey, the flower I planted is just purple. I have no idea what it's called. But I think the plants that I planted outside of my yard, they're called, like, snake something, right? Snake something. I don't know why you're laughing right now, right? They're, like, called snake something. And then, so the person I was talking to, they, they take out their phone. They, you know, start typing something in, and they show me this picture, right? Go ahead and show, show the picture. And as soon as they showed me the picture, I was like overjoyed because I identified it correctly, right? So I'm like, yeah, it's, this is it. This is what I planted outside. And they looked at me and they said, that's an indoor plant. I was like, oh my goodness. I was so proud of the fact that I identified what, it was, what I planted, but it turns out to be an indoor plant. Now, what does this have to do with Nicodemus in John 3? Nicodemus, if you remember, he's a part of the Jewish ruling council. That means he can't be unintelligent. He actually went to the Harvard of his day. He knows what he's talking about. Nicodemus actually is completely unlike me in this scenario, right? I have zero knowledge of planting, so therefore I plant indoor plants outside. But Nicodemus, who sits on the Supreme Court, he's not unintelligent, but he should have full knowledge of how to receive eternal life or enter the kingdom of God, because he's an expert Jewish teacher of the law. And so this question in verse 4, when he says, but how can a person re-enter the womb, where does this really odd question come from? That's the question that you should be asking yourself. I don't understand how Nicodemus could land in this space. Well, there's this Jewish literature called Mishnah Sanhedrin, and in this Mishnah Sanhedrin, actually, people like Nicodemus, we, we begin to see their beliefs how Nicodemus could ever have reached this point of questioning. And we'll, I'll show it behind me. It's Mishnah 10.1. And this is what Nicodemus believed, which is why he can't understand what Jesus is saying. It says, all Jews, notice that, meaning by your affiliation with a people, all Jews have a share in the world to come. But Jesus just said, no, you gotta be, you got to be born again. So Nicodemus is like, well, how is that possible? How can I go back into my mother's womb? It says, all Jews have a share of the world to come, as it says in Isaiah 60. Thy people, the Israelites, Jews, like Nicodemus, they're all righteous, and they shall inherit the land forever. But the people who don't inherit are the ones who don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They don't believe in the Torah, and they don't believe the Torah is from heaven, and ones who denigrate this holy word. So in other words... The reason why in John 3, Nicodemus doesn't understand what Jesus is saying is because if you're a Jew, he believed that unless there is extraordinarily a crazy amount of apostasy or wickedness, he would enter the kingdom of God. He's saying, I'm a Jew. I'm a part of Israel. Of course, I have a 100% guarantee that I'm a part of this new world. It's like the opposite of me telling you that I guarantee you 100% that the Bears will not win the Super Bowl this year. That's a guarantee. Did that hurt your feelings? Yeah, some of you are like, ah, oh, man, that's stung. I thought you were supposed to encourage me today. When Nicodemus is saying, man, just slide into his shoes for a moment, okay? In John 3, right, he's coming to this teacher of the law, and he's saying, according to the Mishnah, all of my life I have heard that morality being good, being a part of the right family tree gets me into eternal life. And I'm just waiting for this Messiah to come to take over and give me new freedom. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 the prerequisite is that you have to be born again. It's not obedience, such as faithful attendance, giving money, praying, more righteousness, but being born again. It's not about the genealogy or who your father was, but it's about being born again. Let me just make this application to you, all right? In 2021, it's actually not about signing a salvation card. It's not praying a prayer. It's not coming forward during an altar call or raising your hand when a pastor asks you if you want to be born again or to believe in Jesus. Signing a card, coming forward, praying a prayer, and raising your hand, all of those things might symbolize your desire to trust in Jesus and to be born again. But the symbol of your agreement does not save you. Jesus saves you and makes you born again. And this is a distinction that Jesus is trying to help make for Nicodemus. Now take a look at verse 5 to verse 10. 
Jesus is about to set up for us how we can be born again. In verse 5, it reads, Very truly, I tell you that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Okay? Flesh gives uh, birth to flesh, but the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised, Nicodemus, at my saying that you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Holy Spirit. Verse 9, but I don't understand. How could this be? You are Israel's teacher, asked Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Now, we'll pause there. Now, at this point, you might be a bit confused about what Jesus is trying to say. What is this talk about water and the Spirit in verse 5? What does this talk about verse 6? Flesh giving birth to flesh and Spirit giving birth to Spirit. Or verse 8, the wind just blowing wherever it wants to. And this is what I want to suggest to you. I'm going to contend to you. Is that if you take a look at verse 7 and 10, right? Jesus' assumption in verses 7 and 10, Jesus' assumption in verse 7 and 10 clarifies verse 5. And verse 5 clarifies verse 6 and 8. I know that was a mouthful. But if we're able to understand what Jesus assumes that Nicodemus should know, then that's going to clarify for us verse 5. And verse 5 is going to clarify for us verse 6 and 8. Take a look at verse 7 and 10. Jesus is assuming that because Nicodemus is a Pharisee or a teacher of the law who understands the Old Testament so much that he would have had the entirety of it memorized, that in verse 7 and 10 he says, I don't understand why you're confused. Like you should understand what I'm trying to tell you. That's the assumption that Jesus is making. Now, if you take a look at verse 5, it says, born of water and born of spirit. The key is trying to understand what is Jesus talking about when it says water, when it says spirit. And some actually argue that this water here is attributing to the amniotic fluid that comes out of a woman when they give birth. You know, I wish somebody had told me that there's a lot of fluid that comes out when a baby comes out, but nobody, you know, cared enough to mention that to me. And so when it, my wife was giving birth, I, I just looked at the doctor and I was like, is this normal, right? And the doctor is like, just get away from me. Like, we're trying to deliver this child right now. What is wrong with you? So some, some people think that this water, it's talking about a physical rebirth that you need to have by being reborn. But here's the problem with that interpretation. When you go back and read through all these sources that existed linear with the Bible, parallel to the Bible, you're never going to find amniotic fluid or water related to physical birth. You know, it just wouldn't make sense for Nicodemus. He wouldn't be able to understand what Jesus is saying. It would be, it would be like me going back into the 1800s and seeing something super, super cool and then saying, dude, that was lit. And people turn around panicking, saying, what's on fire, right? It just doesn't make any sense. They couldn't understand. Nicodemus could not understand if this reference to water in verse 5 was amniotic fluid. Some people say, well, maybe Jesus is talking about baptism. So being reborn and being born again means you have to do one thing through the Spirit, but you also have to be baptized. Therefore, if you're not baptized, then you're not saved. Is that what Jesus is saying? The problem with that interpretation is that if in John 3, track with me, that Jesus meant that you had to be baptized to be saved, then you would think in John 3 with this conversation with Nicodemus, he would mention that in writing. He would communicate that verbally. But he doesn't. He doesn't bring it up again. And in other New Testament texts, we see that baptism is an external symbol of your internal commitment. It doesn't save you. So what does verse 5, again, Jesus mean by water and spirit, if Jesus is assuming that he should know? So if he's a teacher of the law and he understands the Old Testament, then one of the clearest pictures and ways that we see water and spirit coming together is in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 to 27. Ezekiel 36, and this is what it reads in verse 25. Uh, we'll put it on the screen here for you. It says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away, and you will no longer worship idols. So in verse 25 and in verse 5, when Jesus says water, he's talking about the cleansing that Moses talks about in his law. So it's more of a picture. It's a metaphor of what Jesus will do by cleansing you. It's more of a word picture or a metaphor than an actual rebirth. 
a physical rebirth or a baptism. It's just talking about the fact that in Jesus, your, your sins will be washed clean. But take a look at verses 26 and 27. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in. It says, I'm going to give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart, and I'll put my Holy Spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus in John 3, in order for you to be born again, you must first have your sins washed away, represented by the water, by Jesus, and then receive the Holy Spirit, represented by the word Spirit. Now at this point, you might be thinking, but John, how do I even know if I'm sinning? Right? In order for me to assume that I need to be reborn, I need to assume that I've sinned in my life. Like, what does that even look like in my life? You know, I always drive 55 on 355, you know? Like, what does that even mean? You know, we don't have time to unpack all of it, but I'm just going to give you Matthew 5 to 7. Matthew 5, 7, you're going to see an incredible description of Jesus, what he means by sin. So I'll just give that to you as a notation. But here's just one way to think about sin. Right? And see if this is true for you. One pastor says it this way. It says that sin is building your identity on something other than God. Sin is building your identity on something other than God. That means that when we put even good things, right, like family, job, money, moral standards, dreams, our sexuality, your child, if you have one, your desire for marriage, those are all good things, but things are people that should not be your ultimate thing. It shouldn't be your primary foundation on which you build your identity. Or maybe you build your identity around what your boss thinks, what your mom or your dad thinks, what your sister, your brother, your friends, your coworkers, or what your kids think. And God's saying to Nicodemus, you're building your life on the foundation of your moral superiority, that you're an innovator of the law, that you are a Jewish by heritage, and therefore you believe that your identity is secure. And God's saying, Jesus is saying, no, 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 you must be born again. You know, one of the easiest ways to see if you've built or I've built your identity on something other than God is to see what happens in your own heart when you experience some type of work kid, relational, financial, or future hope failure. It should sting because people, they matter to us, and dreams and things and the things that we value, they matter to us. But if that failure crushes you, then the question becomes, have we placed our identity on something other than God? Are we trying to build our lives on something other than God? Now take a look at verse 6. It says, flesh gives birth to flesh, so the Spirit only gives birth to the Spirit. What does that mean? Hey, so this week I was uh, reading an article, and you're not going to believe the title of this article. I thought it was just fake news, but it says, scientists want to resurrect the woolly mammoth. Did you hear that? By 2027, we might have a woolly mammoth amongst us. They're trying to revive them in six years through crispr cat nine technology. Don't ask me what CRISPR-Cas9 means. It just sounds like some formula to make uh, bacon a little bit more crispy. I have no idea what it means, right? But through this CRISPR technology, what they want to do is they want to take the closest relative to a woolly mammoth, which is the Asian elephant, and they want to take frozen mammoth DNA, insert it into this Asian uh, elephant, and as as a result, you would have something called a mammophant. So you take mammoth and elephant, you put it together, and you'd have a mammophant, which would be the closest to a living woolly mammoth. It would behave like it, it would kind of look like it, and it would kind of be like it. But isn't it it true that even with 2021 CRISPR technology, we still can't create or have reborn a 100% genuine, authentic woolly mammoth? We can't do it. We can only do something that's slightly similar or maybe looks the same in appearance, but is not genuinely, truly a woolly mammoth. You know what Jesus is saying similarly in verse 6? He's saying just like you can't recreate or make reborn a 100% genuine mammoth, so you cannot in your own flesh, 
in your own will, in your own way, create or be reborn again through your own will. You can't do it because flesh, your sinful flesh, will always birth sinful flesh. It is only the Holy Spirit that can make you be reborn again, which is why in verse 8 it says the Holy Spirit is going to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, whoever it wants, and it's going to flow and save people in whatever way he wants. Hey, can I just make this side note real quick? We as Christians, if you're a believer in Jesus, you and I, we can't command or manipulate the Holy Spirit. We can't just command him to do something or to do that or to be somewhere or to be in the space. The Holy Spirit, as God, cannot be controlled by us. It doesn't matter if we have 10,000 strobe lights and 15,000 fog machines and it's just blasting in a sanctuary and we can't breathe and the electric guitar is playing that fifth bridge for the fifth time. The Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. He doesn't. Verse 8 is telling you he's going to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants to do it. He's going to move like the wind. Hey, if you go outside and there's a breeze, you have no idea where it's coming from, right? Or how it's going to move or where it's going next. And so it is with the Holy Spirit. The gift of salvation and the way that the Holy Spirit moves, that's his gift. It's his doing. It's whatever he wants to do. Now at this point, uh, if you take a look at verse 10, you're going to notice that Jesus, although he has thus far laid the groundwork for salvation, right? He says you've got to be born again in spirit. You've got to be born again through water. He still hasn't given us the method through whom we will or can be saved. He just said you've got to be born again through spirit and water. And if he just left us at verse 10, then we'd be in quite a bit of trouble. Then we would come before the Holy Spirit and say, we have no idea what you're doing. We, all we know is we need water and spirit and we need to be reborn, but we don't know what the methodology is. So we're just going to like enchant and do whatever we can. We're just going to pray harder and we're just going to pray and we're going to hope that it's going to work. But Jesus doesn't leave us that way. Start taking a look at verse 11. He gives us the methodology and he even Nicodemus the methodology and through how we're saved. Verse 11, very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people, you don't accept our testimony. What is it? I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you don't believe. Then how will you believe if I speak of the heavenly things? Verse 13. No one has ever gone into heaven. Right? That's eternal life, right? He's using the methodology or the illustration of heaven, the metaphor of heaven, to say, hey, you want to be born again? You want to have eternal life? He says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man saying you want to be reborn? Well, guess what? There's only one way because there's only one person that came from heaven. And he said, it's the Son of Man. And then verse 14, it seems to be taking kind of a weird turn. It says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, this turn in verse 15 with Moses, it seems odd until you actually go to Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. And this is what's happening in Numbers 21, right? So the people of Israel, they've uh, left Egypt, and they're kind of mumbling, and they're arguing against God. They're saying, God, I can't believe you're doing this to me. And in that moment, some snakes come, okay? Snakes come to the people of Israel, and they start getting bitten. And as they're getting bitten, they start to die because of the venom of the snake. In God's grace in Numbers 21, God tells Moses, take a bronze snake put it on top of a staff and lift the staff up in the air, and anybody who looks at that snake won't die, even if you get bitten. Now take a look at verse 15 with that context. It's verse 14, it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness so that they may not die and not perish, so Jesus must be lifted up. The Son of Man is a designation that Jesus makes of himself. He says, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Jesus is saying, and this phrase lifted up happens in John four times. And every time this word lifted up happens in the book of John, it's talking about Jesus being elevated and being lifted up to the cross. Do you see what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, in order for you to be born again, Nicodemus, you know what you need? You don't need an innovative morality. You don't need to do better. You don't have to think better. You don't have to get your life in order. What you need is to be lifted up with your eyes, to look at the one who is lifted up, who is Jesus, who went to the cross for you. Amen. And that's the only way that you can be born again and reborn again. He says, don't you understand? What, what do I, what do you mean? I'm a teacher of the law. I have Jewish heritage. You must be born again. Water and spirit. You must be born again.
Take a look at verse 16. Full circle, right? This is the 92 million Google lookups by Tim Tebow in verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world. And I'm going to make some insertions here uh, just to help us see the role of the Holy Spirit even in salvation. But if you're looking at verse 16, it's for God the Father, right? For God the Father so loved the world that the Father gave his one and only Son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him through the Spirit shall not perish but have eternal life. Meaning be reunited with God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me do it for you in a picture form, all right? Take a look at here. This is the summary. So if you have God the Father here, John 3, 1 to 16, right? You have God the Father at the top who sends his son Jesus to die on the cross so that the Holy Spirit, we saw in John 7, 50, the Holy Spirit has not yet come upon you because Jesus has not yet been lifted up, it says. The Spirit has not yet been poured out to you in its fullness because Jesus has not yet been lifted up. He hasn't been glorified. So God the Father sends His Son Jesus to die on the cross so that we may receive the Holy Spirit, so that our need for salvation in our lives are illuminated, and so that we may be reunited with God the Father. Do you realize that you cannot be saved apart from the work of the Holy Spirit? Do you realize, although it is Jesus and his death being on the cross, being elevated, being lifted up, is what saves you, it is the Holy Spirit who illuminates your need for Jesus. Remember in verse 8, it says, the wind will blow wherever it wants to blow. You can see it. You can't see it. You cannot tell where it comes, but it will do whatever it wants to do. So everyone who is born of the Spirit... Uh, this afternoon, we start off this message by quoting Spurgeon that without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without wind. That means in John 3 that our hearts need to be reborn by the wind, the Holy Spirit, to receive salvation. So here are just two application questions for you as I close. Number one, do you need to be reborn? Ask the Holy Spirit to show you your need for Jesus. If you believe that it is by your morality, by your niceness, by your family lineage, because your parents were Christian, because your great parents were Christian, Jesus says to you, you got to be born again. Here's a second. If you're praying for somebody that you love to see Jesus, ask the Holy Spirit to move. Ask the Holy Spirit to move like the wind in verse 8 and show them Jesus lifted up. Come before God, the Holy Spirit, and say, God, it is you, Holy Spirit, who illuminates. If you remember from last week, we said it is you, Holy Spirit, who provides hope. Do you have to pray on that? I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. We're going to close uh, by singing the song that we taught to you last week. It's called fresh wind and just as we see the metaphor of jesus using the wind as a metaphor for the holy spirit uh, there's a chorus and in the chorus it just repeats pour your spirit out right pour your spirit out now some of you might be thinking john last week you talked to us about the fact that the holy spirit came because of jesus's exaltation because he came to earth he died on the cross and he was lifted up so the outpouring of the spirit has come already and if you're a believer in jesus the holy spirit already lives inside of you why are we singing and asking for god to pour out the holy spirit that doesn't make sense if the holy spirit is already here inside a believer why are we asking for the holy spirit to be poured out in first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 19 paul's writing to the church in thessalonica and he says he says don't quench the spirits and actually, in Acts 6, it says there's a guy named Stephen who was full of the Spirit. So there's a sense where you can have the Holy Spirit living inside of you because you're a believer, but you can quench the Spirit of God in you by the way that you're choosing to live. You know, in verse 2 of the song, it says, repent. As we repent, would you pour the Spirit out? And it's in the same way, when we're singing this song, God, would you just pour out your Spirit in my life? There needs to be a place of reevaluation in our own lives to say, God, are there areas in my life where I'm not walking with you, where I'm quenching the Holy Spirit, where maybe I'm building my life on things that are not you, where my identity is not upon you? 
where I'm cooling or suppressing the spirit that's in me. It has to be a moment of us saying, God, I'm sorry for that. I turn back to you. And as I do that, would you just pour out your spirit? You know, the, the amazing thing about Nicodemus is there are two people. You ready? There are two people at the end of the book of John that come back to wrap up Jesus' body. Do you know who the two people are? One is Joseph, and the other one is Nicodemus. Something happened between John 3 and John 17. Nicodemus was reborn. The Holy Spirit did a work in his life. He says yes to Jesus. You're either in two categories this afternoon. One, you either need to be reborn again, or two, there's something in your heart, something in your life that you have chosen to place above God. How do I know that's true? Because it's true in my life. Daily repentance, saying, God, we want to pursue you, your priority, your number one. That's an every day, every moment type of thing. Let's do this. Let's all rise together as we close and sing this song. And uh, Tabby is gonna, Tabitha is going to lead us through this song. But as she does that, I just want to give you a moment. So if you're willing, go ahead and close your eyes and bow your heads. And if there is maybe a conviction of the Holy Spirit, again, not through crazy fog machines and strobe lights, but just the gentle conviction of the Holy Spirit that says, hey, you need to be saved. You thought the raising of your hand saved you. Guess what? It didn't. It was simply a symbol. It's only Jesus who saves. Maybe you need to ask the Holy Spirit for salvation through the power of the cross. Or maybe you, like me, need to come before God right now in the next 30 seconds or so and say, God, I just want to build my life on you. You are the one on which I build my life. Not anything else but you. 30 seconds between you and the Lord, and then we'll sing this song as a prayer to him. Let's pray together for that. Father, I just pray, Lord God, uh, for the presence of your spirit here in this place. God, we know that you already reside in the believer, that those who are in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit already lives and resides. The Holy Spirit, we pray that you would bring just upon a conviction of repentance, God, a conviction of uh, renewal, Lord, a, a new movement of your spirit, an encouragement of your spirit. God, we need you. Lord, we need you to be the number one person and priority in our lives. Not the things that we desire are even good, not even our family, which are good things. But you, God, would you illuminate that Holy Spirit? Would you do that move? And if there are people in this room or on the, on the stream that need to place their trust in you, Jesus, to be reborn again, I pray that you'd make that happen. How of your spirit, God, would you do it? Father, I just ask by the power of your son Jesus, who you gave for us, who lived, who walked, who died on the cross and was lifted up, was elevated in glory. And now because of him, we have access to the spirit of God, to the Holy Spirit, your presence inside of our lives. I pray that you do a new thing. God, do a new thing in our hearts. God, do a new thing in our lives right now, in this moment. God, not tomorrow. Holy Spirit, you can do whatever you want. But we're praying, we're just asking that you would come as we repent of our sin, as we turn back to you, that you would bring a new encouragement, God, that you would bring a new sense of your presence, that you would clarify the direction of our lives, you would clarify our need for you. God, won't you do that? Won't you do only what you can do? you pour your spirit out in this in this place and in our hearts uh, we ask this in jesus name amen would you sing this with me
know the reason why we, we tried to and we tagged the God is so good part at the end? It's because as we ask for the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, we also want to just give recognition and praise to God to say He is good. The reason why we even get to sing these songs of being reborn in salvation is because He's so good to us. The last part in the book of Jude, it says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you before the glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. All God's people said, amen, amen. Hey, if you want to just receive prayer for something or someone that you're praying about, we'd love to pray for you. If you have a question about salvation, we'd love to pray with you and talk to you about that. You have 168 hours this week. Won't you go live every single one for Jesus? Thanks for being here. Amen.